and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a return of good brother to the temple, creator of 3 minutes, 50-50, and and Henshin now coming back with Henshin's new newest expansion, Guest Stars. I should say only expansion because of, because I think before this there was just a couple <laughs> of mod a couple of uh, modules. That's the correct. One and only Sam Cusick. How you hello, doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me back, Mildred. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for com Thank you for coming on. Um. Congrats on managing to get three minutes out into the wild, even if it took more than Thank three you. minutes. <laughs> it was a condensed. I went into, uh, you know, I went into a pocket universe, and uh, <laughs> it was the opposite, though. Three minutes elapsed there, and uh, nine months elapsed here. But are we, uh, thanks, some, I... are we talking some hyperbolic time chamber shit? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I built it with the funds that were uh, provided through the Kickstarter campaign, um, and now I've got it, but it's just, it's broken, so I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to sell it. I should have offered it as a uh, reward in this. But yeah, I'm back with another uh, another Kickstarter campaign, this time uh, expanding our, our, I guess, best game or flagship game. Uh, not best game, that's not fair. I love all my children equally, um, but our yeah, most well-known... <laughs> Our most well-known game, uh, Henshin, a Sentai RPG. And you're right, there's never been an expansion for this. Um, there's only been modules, which are pre-made adventures, uh, not necessarily any sort of like mechanical changes or differences. Um, but this expansion adds uh, six new playbooks uh, to the, the game, uh, which we've never done before. All 11 were included in that core rulebook that was kickstarted in 2019. Mm-hmm. But even even with that, you you describe the playbooks as temporary playbooks, like they're meant for a single episode, and that and that's it. Right. Yep. They are they are guest stars. So, uh, like, if you're familiar with the game and you've read through it, we added three playbooks uh, at the end of the last campaign. One of them being Orange, who was supposed to represent a civilian or a connection, somebody in the story who's not necessarily a hero gets powers temporarily and then loses them at the end of that session, uh, which is a trope, you know, you see in Sentai and, and Power Rangers occasionally. Um, guest stars, we wanted to provide players with a way to augment campaigns um, to, to do a couple of things, right? I think it's easy for people to be at a table for maybe a little too long playing the same character. And maybe that character has run its course. Maybe the ideas you've had for them, um, you're, you're kind of bored by, or you need a break from, uh, or this happens to me a lot. I'll have friends visit and I have like an existing group or, or a campaign going on. And my friend wants to drop in, but it's kind of hard to integrate them into maybe like a larger sweeping campaign. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And have them feel more impactful. So I wanted to, to come up with a way to add, like inject some of that fun into Henshin without taking away from the core squad. Right. Uh, so the guest stars, it's a mix of characters that you would have seen before. So we have uh, Gray, Brown, and Copper, uh, who are respectively like the custodian of your squad, the person who manages your powers, the general kind of like your Goldar-like figure, um, and then a team mascot. Uh, so think like your Alpha 5, or I always think about... Uh, I, I modeled this a lot on Peebo, who I believe is from Bioman, mm. uh, which is an older Sentai. Um, so those are characters that like would have been in the background, would have been played by uh, the narrator, um, and they're finally coming to uh, to the limelight. They're getting their own story. Um, and then we also have uh, three other playbooks, Navy, Multicolored, um, and I guess uh, Cyan would fall into the previous group, but you don't see them as much, where Navy is uh, effectively a, 
they're modeled after a common writer character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a child of, of the 90s, uh, so I grew up uh, with being introduced to Mess Rider. I know that not the greatest introduction but to common Rider, but it's still fun aesthetics regardless. Um, so we wanted to introduce a, a writer style character, another hero that exists outside of the group who's sort of operating in their own uh, sense of justice and righteousness. And then Multicolored is a uh, monster who's decided that they don't really want to fight anymore um, and they're off doing their own grand adventures. Uh, and then Cyan is uh, somebody's mech or somebody's zord. So not not the megazord necessarily. I think some folks have gotten confused by that. Mm-hmm. But it would be like if Billy from Mighty Morphin's Triceratops uh, went awry. Or you see that a little bit in like uh, Dino Charge or Tiryuger where you have uh, uh, Tira or Tyra, the uh, king's zord really has a mind of its own at points Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like doesn't follow orders, is doing its own thing. Maybe there's a problem with it. Maybe it's feeling neglected, um, but that's a playbook as well. So that's, that's kind of, I know that's a lot of information for people to absorb, but that's kind of the TLDR and the new six that are getting added. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in, with that in mind, uh, with the, within each of the play within each of the playbooks, there's u- there's usually el- elements like connections, ta- um, tasks, and uh, regular turns, le- um, and the like. What would be an, what would be an example of of say a um, say turn say turn actions for for instance? Let's go with the gray since. That's usually would it, I think it'd be fair to say that Gray is meant to be the is meant to be the archetype of the mentor deciding to step in. Yes, yes. So yeah, no, that's a great question, and you're right that every one of these playbooks will operate in the same way. So you know, while the way they play at the table is different, they're there for a limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. The way that somebody would play them is not different. The choices are just different and they're catered to that unique experience. So it is a little bit more of a a streamlined character, right? And you see that reflected in um, the connections here deal a lot more with existing colors. So gray is a great example where uh, you know, normally, if you take a look at red or blue, um, they talk about a cast uh, outside of the squad. So you have like a parent or a student or a rival on a sports team or activity. Um, for gray, we've had, uh, you know, colors that you're a color you're particularly close to, a color who's lost their way, a color who's leading the rest of the team. So really setting up what's my connection with the established players so that way I can we can build uh, some story there. We can build some jumping off points for the narrative. Um, You'll see that across some of the other playbooks. Brown has that as well, where there's, you know, uh, a color that caught your interest, a color you take pity on, um, really just reinforcing. The purpose of these playbooks is to not, in in a way they are taking a bit of the spotlight away from the other players, but everything that they do should give back to the core squad because eventually they're going to leave and that squad is going to have to continue to operate. Mm-hmm. And if and when it comes to Brown, because of the fact that the, the enemy force is, is broadly defined by default, um, I'm guessing that within that playbook, there's some advice on how to, on how to util, how to turn what would be the general in any other circumstance into a unwilling ally. How to frame how to frame it and so on. Yeah, yeah. So each are the core the core rule book that people receive as part of the Kickstarter uh, includes includes the following, and I'll give you just a high level breakdown of what's included. So. If you get the book, you're going to get all six playbooks that are included in there. Um, there's going to be uh, pre-made characters as well, like we did for uh, the uh, core Henshin book, the Henshin Sentai RPG book, which had 11 characters for the 11 playbooks. 
I wrote them to kind of be within the same universe, so there's more of a blanket, uh, just kind of aestheticless universe that's in there. I made a uh, fun fact if you're a fan, if you're a deep fan of Henshin, I made Gray, Pink's grandmother. Um, I tried to tie each one of the pre-generated characters to an existing character, uh, which I think will be, you know, a fun little in-universe thing. Um, we're also hoping to add another set of pre-made monsters through the campaign, so those would be included. And then you have guidelines for play about when you should use a guest star playbook, um, how to blend them into the narrative, and uh, maybe if you haven't established any characters before, how to retrofit them um, in to the, to the uh, existing story. Um, and then there's guidance on uh, how they should enter, leave, and any returns that they make. And jumping off of that, um, the book's going to provide you with some suggested story beats and endings for the characters so you have a way to sort of get them in there and get them out cleanly, maybe leaving the door open for them to return later on. But, you know, for Brown, since uh, that's who you asked about, um, I've done something like you and another color or colors get lost in a dimension as a result of uh, like an energy weapon from your explosions and you have to find a way to get out together. So you're kind of forced in that scenario to work together or Brown gets kicked out or storms out of the big bad's lair, needs to prove themselves to some way to get back in their good graces. You know, there's a couple of, of ways that you can take them out, take them, uh, make them a fish out of water, I guess, of their normal scenario. Um, and that's really what we're leaning on to give that character more of a spotlight. Yeah. And I'm guess I'm guessing that the way you've had, had it set up d could potentially account for if someone is, as if someone's deciding to take, to take the approach of having the general, do a full face turn because that's not unheard of of course yeah you know my recommendation in that sense and i this is in the initial playbook or the initial book um and it's something i would encourage here as well is if that serves the story that is like you said it's it happens it's not always the most common scenario right um sometimes you see people just continue to to stay bad or they go off and go on their own if that character does want to play a larger role, I would encourage people to uh, look to transition them to a different color. Um, because there are, you know, if Brown wanted to become good, say, um, they could always transition to white, maybe to gold, to silver. Uh, those characters in the book traditionally have, represent somebody who has had a lot of power in the past or has a lot of experience um, and is now sort of bringing it and is either challenged by that um, or is trying to seek a path of redemption. Um, I would say take a look at the rest of the colors and see if there there's another fit for bringing that character into the rest of the larger uh, campaign fold. Because again, the way that these books are written uh, is they are written to be intended for short-term play not for long-term play so if you try and take these for you know more than three sessions i would say you're probably going to start bumping up against some of the rails that have been deliberately set um and that's you know that's that's intentional i think there's only so much story option to explore with these playbooks before they start to become moot and they start to really mirror each other. Um, so this was the best way, in my opinion, to keep this unique and meaningful without taking away from the rest of what is included in the book. Mm -hmm. Now, continuing on from th from that, oh, I know you. I know you said that your that the that the um ma the masked writer experiment was one of the inspirations when it came to Navy, though in the in the last 20 or so years, the idea of Kamen Rider and Super Sentai ha crossing over has been a bit more common, even if in one form it was through the Spring movies, which is a whole other kettle of fish I've covered on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm guessing, I'm guessing that this was something that was requested quite a bit due to 
um, all due to also having um, Ryder Kocho under your be under your belt. Yeah, you know, it did it did come up um, surprisingly not as frequently as you know some other things. I think some people. Here's something that's interesting, and I, I think you'll appreciate this, is that I think there are some people in the community who get, like, pretty hung up on wanting to emulate specific character stories. So Crimson gets brought up a lot uh, as an option. I think I think about, like, Hello Soldier uh, from uh, Q Ranger as a good example of that, where those are the those are some of the requests that come up of, Hey, how can I do a more, you know, senior or, or battle ridden ranger? And to be honest, I feel like a lot of that's already been covered in gold and silver and white and to an extent like purple, although purple is, um, you know, a, a bit more of the, like I'm evil, but am I, could I be good? Uh, so, there have been common writer requests, but surprisingly, like writer country is its own little unique audience. I think there's a lot of writer fans who are really devoted, especially because that that game is like tonally a lot grittier. The adventure that's included in that is about like a city under constant construction. The families that you're fighting are uh, the people who control the flow of industry and the monsters are all like, based off of dangerous, poisonous, heavy metals. Um, it's got a real kind of mature tone to it um, that I think people like with, like, you know, Fives, uh, I think is is maybe the example I would throw out there of, like, it's tough. You know, it's a tough common Rider series. Uh, people die in it uh, as opposed to uh, something a little bit lighter. I know Ghost has a lot of death in it, but I would say... Uh, it's it's kind of a bit more playful than some of the other series I've seen. Yeah, and while it's not a writer series, I could see um, I could see invoking some, something like Giver because in that in that right, same right. ballpark, um, especially yeah, since Giver's Ishinomori's it's uh, manga has always had a tinge of horror to it. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, I remember picking up the Seven Seas collection of, of Kamen Rider, and, you know, you see the jaw opening up uh, on the Rider helmet, which we don't get uh, a ton of these days, but I always love when that happens. And, yeah, Ishinomori definitely, uh, if you looked at, like, Cyborg 009, there's a lot of, like, body horror in there and, and what it means, what war and these kind of conflicts do to people's lives. Um and that's definitely that's definitely more present in Ryder Conchu. And it's funny, like, there haven't been as many requests to bring a rider over, and I wouldn't I wouldn't exactly bring the same kind of like aesthetic notes from Ryder Conchu that I did into uh Henshin. The Rider book we've created here is a little bit more I want to say like tonally light and, and fun kind of a, like it really is, you know, it invokes that kind of like, I'm a cocky teenager kind of vibe or like, I'm a little bit of a cocky know-it-all. Um, but the thing that does for people who are familiar with both games, the thing that's different in Rider Conchu is that characters can collect gear, which has uh, gear are items that have, different narrative moves that if you spend tokens on them, you can, you know, lock people in place. You can negate somebody's move. You can switch people's locations. There's a bunch of different stuff you can do over the course of the game. Um, the rider playbook or the Navy playbook in this game uh, does have gear as well. And that gear can be left behind as a raise at the end of their session to give to the rest of the squad. Um, so that's a unique thing that we've, we've brought from that game into uh into the Henshin ex guest stars expansion is the incorporation of gear. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to get, when it comes to gear, is that meant to be le like a tag? Is it meant to be something that's within the um to within the token based affair with um, turns? How does gear um, work out? It is, it is within the token-based uh, affair of turns. So all of the effects are written uh, like turns, um, and you would just use them the same way that you use a token. Um, 
So it's, you know, it's the moves are a bit more specific and, and would be narrative based of like, we have a, a blast microphone where you can amplify your voice and like shock people giving you a moment of reprieve, maybe a moment to get away or set up another move or something like that. But it would be again in the place of kind of a, it's an additional heavy turn, right? That somebody could use. Mm-hmm. That cer that certainly makes sense. Now, with that in with that in mind, I'd like to shift a bit into um copper. You had you had mentioned that it's meant to meant to be the ma meant to be the mascot, but uh, again, much like with the much like with the brown, do you have that same sort of framing setup as well as possibly suggestions on what colors to shift into if if copper wants to go in long term yeah so copper um you know the the main thing about copper again like brown it's kind of the i have been in a supporting role maybe making tech on the side or making changes to uh the mechs or the zords that you have available and now i've been put into situations where i'm gonna have to see combat in a way that i never have before um so it's story beats uh, really get into like, you, uh, I can read off a couple of them that I have here of mm -hmm. you, sneak away, you sneak away on a mission that you weren't supposed to and it goes bad. Uh, you get kidnapped by the big bad in general with another color or colors and you need to fight your way out. Uh, or the base gets ambushed and only you and one other color are there to defend it. So it's really putting them in a place of danger that they may not have been before. Um, and uh, just seeing what they can do. And their moves allow them to do some, like, defensive, offensive stuff narratively. Like, you can take over pieces of tech. Um, you do have the ability to transform. Uh, that's not necessarily taking on a suit, but maybe taking on a state uh, that you've never had before or you didn't know was capable. Uh, and you can also, you know, you are... It's not explicitly stated that you are a robot, but the art is robotic. A lot of the characters uh, that this is modeled after are robotic. You don't have to be, but it's kind of intended for you to have a relationship with machines, right? Um, or, so or you can also pilot the, other people's. Yeah, or at the very least with the same kit that the rest of the team is using. You know, the, totally. tech, the tech guy, as, as mentioned before. Um, totally. And and that feeds into, you know, you asked about if you were to take on another color. I think copper, because they are, uh, they're painting, or we're painting that playbook as someone who's really new to combat and is not familiar with it and is not as, as hardened, I think, as some other characters are. I think if you were to take a look at, like, some of the the main colors like blue or green or pink, I think would be good fits where those are characters who are all really exploring a lot about like the way that they're feeling. Maybe they are uncomfortable and are lacking confidence in who they are and what they can offer. Or maybe they're just like really interested in machines and building out interesting things. Like I think any of the core rule books could fit nicely there. Um, but those those three of blue, green, and pink, I think, would be a really strong fit. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, go now going for going forward. When it, cyan, you had already mentioned as um, a as the mech going haywire, and a lot of a lot of the times when that's been used in Sentai, um, it's mm -hmm. typically used with with ones where the mechs are, um. S either semi-conscious or fu or full-on conscious. Oh, mm. you ca you kind of had that with Zero Ranger. Obviously, you had that with Kyoto Uger. Oh, is that? Ca but how would how would somebody possibly use Cyan if if the mech and if the mech the Zord what have you in their campaign isn't the, isn't that um, level of sentient? Um. Good question. So one of the story prompts that I had for that is, you know, you get taken over by a, or the mech gets taken over by a uh, 
computer virus. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is kind of the programming gets wired, things get crossed. Maybe that is taking on just like a, a different behavioral approach to who the enemy is or what you need to do. Um, you know, with the, it is an interesting mix of like some of the story prompts are sentient where you are mad at your associated color or you're feeling, you know, lethargic, bored, you've gotten sick, something like that, where it is a little bit more behavioral. Um, but the the turns are not necessarily um, always treated in that way. You know, you still have a lot of uh, attacks that you can make. Um, the interesting thing about cyan, uh, brown, and multicolored is they do not transform. So if you're not familiar with Henshin, every character has the ability to transform into their armored state, right? So you go from civilian to hero. Um, You have that classic Sentai uh, armor, which you decide upon when you start the adventure. Um, And gray, navy, and copper all have the ability to transform into a different uh, battle-ready state, right? Or an armored state. But brown, multicolored, and cyan uh, do not. They instead grow to giant size, right? So if you were to take uh, if you were to take cyan and you really wanted to just have them like they're angry or they are just uh, something has gotten messed up with their programming and they're on the warpath, you can grow to giant size. You can start making attacks across the city. Uh, or wherever you're at, or against your other people, and really just kind of become this like berserker machine and and play things that way. But I will, you know, I will discourage people from that because that's not necessarily interesting. <laughs> um, Henshin does not track hit points. We don't track attack points. We're we're a really narrative heavy and story forward game. So I would encourage people to uh, take a look at. Uh, the references you mentioned, uh, as well as I think Gow Ranger, you see a bit of this in there, where those animal spirits really have a lot of personality. And there's a lot of discussion about how they're feeling and uh, how the conflict that they're going through is impacting them. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that as the source material, because that is really going to feed uh, science story forward and make it feel like it matters if you choose to play it. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the the last one on the list is multicolored, which would it be fair to say multicolored is is a catch all for those monsters of the week that deci- that decide to e- either start a face tur- start a face turn or just aren't that much of fighters. Like some of the mo- yes. some of the monsters of the week and say Time Ranger slash Time Force come to mind for that. Yes, this also draws. Um, there's two examples I drew pretty heavily from from Jetman, which I think I've talked about before, being a pretty big influence for me. Of uh, there's an episode where the blue uh, Rangers teddy bear becomes a central part of a trash monster, and when the trash monster has to fight Jetman. The conflict is really about like the fact that she got rid of her teddy bear after all these years and sort of the emotional devastation that comes along with that. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting angle that you can go down. And then there's one that is a little bit more uh, comedic, but I still think is a funny way to look at uh, uh, monsters in Sentai where there's, Occasionally in older Sentai, and a lot of times in, in newer Sentai, you'll see, like, there's one batch of monsters, and then <laughs> halfway through the season, there's a different batch of monsters, and they're called something different because they're tougher. So, like, the challenge level has gone up. Um, and that happens in Jetman, and there's an episode during that run where, like, one of the older monsters is like, I guess I'm irrelevant now. And, like, the whole thing is just him kind of, like, having this existential crisis about not being good enough and like what is he going to do now and that is also like just a really fun kind of like turning the concept on its head uh uh set or episode and that i really wanted to emulate that and like you're saying with time ranger you know there's the example of that monster who is not a criminal but they're still hunting uh hunting them down those are all good examples of what multicolored 
could be. Um, but you could also have fun with it of just like the the monster that was designed for the core rule book is basically made up of a washing machine with a bunch of clothing and laundry, a giant clothespin sword. Um, we made a lot of jokes about them just wanting to open up a laundromat or like start their own business and do something productive with their time and, and their skills. Um, and, you know, what does that look like? What conflicts does that create within the organization, the big bad and the general that they came from? How do they, you know, try and cope with uh, what it means to live amongst humans if they choose to? How do they reconcile things with the squad? Is there anyone in the squad that doesn't believe them? Is there people in the squad that do believe them? There's a lot to play with here, you know, if somebody were to take on that role. Um, mm -hmm. I think in one of the playtests, too, we had uh, the narrator also played, had another monster character. So Multicolored had a, like, partner that they used to be, like, a monster pair with. And so what does that relationship look like, right? Um, there's there's a lot of different ways you could go down this path with Multicolored. And I'm, I'm really excited about that, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Monsters are super fun to play and can have really fun kind of like one note personalities. Uh, but what happens to them, you know, if they survive and the episode ends, what are they doing? Are they just, what are they doing when they're just sitting around the base or just like hanging out in their free time? Who knows? Mm -hmm. So that bring that brings me to the, f the fact that you've got three modules you're pl you're pl you're planning on putting in. Um, and I'd kind of like to go into the the vibe and the, just the general tone that each that each of the modules is meant to have. Not the full not the full on details, obviously. That'd be a bit spoilery, and the and I always want to try and avoid spoilers whenever I can with modules. But mm -hmm. let's start with macabre necromancy. Yeah, and I will say too, um, just to preface this for any of the listeners. Um, we are, when we're doing modules for this expansion, I am hiring guest writers um, for five of the six modules. Um, one of them is a reward, which at time of recording is still open. If you are interested in creating a module for a Hench and a Sentai RPG, you've had a, a killer idea for a while and you have a grand that you are willing to part with, um, please visit the campaign page and get it while you can. That is inclusive of my time to work with you to generate an idea as well as art costs that will be incorporated into the module. So it'll be a full developed adventure that will be included in the book. Um, but in terms of the three that are planned, uh, Macabre Mecromancy, which is written by Matthew Schuff and Andrew Oliver, this is a very, like, it's, it's set distant future in space, but it's not necessarily about space exploration. It's kind of that, like, we're mining other planets and discovering things that maybe should have been left alone, maybe didn't intend to be discovered ever again, and it brings about things, either horrors uh, that are natural to the planet that we, you know, we're hoping were put to bed or put to rest. And so it's about, you know, what do we do in that situation? How do we uh, defend against that? And uh, what kind of sides do we take during that time? So it is a little bit more mature than we've written uh, before for some of the other modules. You know, some of the modules we have in the existing book are like dinosaur wrestlers and like kids at camp using the power of bugs to stop pollution, which I love. Um, and some of, we do have some more mature themes with feral arms, which is what happens with a, or in a world that is completely taken over by pollution monsters. And we have to use the spirits of animals to try and defend the last remnants of earth. Uh, so this is a, you know, another look at a, at a pretty mature uh, set of uh, uh, aesthetics and story, which I'm excited to see where that goes. Mm -hmm. So, with the with that said, the the next one that next one that was on the that was on the list 
was um, Petalpalooza, which yes. <laughs> looks like that. If it if the Kickstarter is any indication, you're the one writing that one. That is me. That is the one that I'm writing. So I uh, I cycle uh, quite a bit in my in my free time. It's the way that I exercise and uh, just helps clear my mind. Um, and I've always wanted to do a bike Sentai because we have you know we have a shitload of car Sentai. Uh, which are fun and I, I enjoy them, but I've always wanted to do something with bikes as a core set of aesthetics. So you know, jumping off of what I was just saying about uh, Macabre Mechamancy, Palooza is going to be just a lot more fun. Um, it's about an elite group of cyclists um, who have to fight against uh, basically a group of uh, automaton energy vampires who are taking uh, energy from automobiles, trains, buses, whatever kind of transportation that's not a bike, you name it. Um, and it is kind of more more of a nod to like Car Ranger, uh, uh, I think is the vibe that I'm going for with that one of like a lot of bike safety, a lot of bike puns. Um, some silly over the top villains, but just like a real a real treat, like a sort of light, enjoyable uh, campaign that you can you can play with some friends and have a good time with. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get I can certainly get that. Now... Yeah, yeah, I I think it's not something that we've necessarily done before. Most everything else has like some serious overtones to it. So it'll be fun to just have something that's like pretty fun for the sake of being fun. You know? Oh, hope, hopefully, hopefully you don't have an entire episode dedicated to Pachinko. <laughs> <laughs> never say never. Um, you know, I can, I'm sure I can find another fun game to throw in there like that. Yeah, I had, I had to get that joke in because the mentor of car ranger, this, um, had that whole thing of Pachinko having life's mysteries <laughs> and, go, and going to a barber shop even though he, <laughs> he's wearing a damn helmet. <laughs> Car, Ra- Good stuff. Car Ranger is... I sometimes, wa- I sometimes wonder if somebody was on something. I think so. Um, there's a lot to it that is odd uh and is you know it's very much considered like a parody season of sentai right which explains sort of like why it's pretty (laughs) why it's pretty out there why it's pretty goofy and looking at you know some of the enemies uh tommy and the rest fight in and turbo especially that pizza guy well that was when tj was uh, was in charge Mm -hmm. um when they fight that uh that pizza villain it's definitely like a little more on the nose, not quite as serious as some other stuff of that time, but you know, that's what keeps Sentai interesting, you know? You get you get all kinds. Mm-hmm. And then the last module we have planned is from Corey Taylor Burns, who is another game designer, a uh, friend of mine. Uh, who, if you haven't checked out his games, Overarms is a really great yep. like. Persona style game, yeah. I've, and, uh, I've interviewed Corey multiple multiple nice. times over over the years. Wonderful, yeah. Corey's Corey's really great people. I'm excited to have him come in and, and do a guest spot here. Um, and yeah, his uh, his module Codex Unbound is kind of a bit more of like a mystery style module. Um, the, the squad discovers uh, some cryptic messages that lead them to an artifact uh, that is going to help them take down the big bad. So it's a little bit more like exploration, mystery, uh, Indiana Jones-ish. It's about uncovering the past, um, having people you know, seek redemption or try and uh, find out more about who they really are. Um, definitely going to be more one of, I think, the story dense or a more story heavy module than the other two that are mentioned in terms of just setting up uh, long tales of stories or setting up big reveals. Um, you'll have an opportunity to tell something a bit more epic, which I think is a nice balance with the with the other two of fun and 
uh, uh, more serious and, you know, macabre for lack of a better word, because it's in the title. Uh, yeah, I'm excited about that one as well. Yeah, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, with that, now with that all in, with that all in mind, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a page count for the, for the thing? Um, so right now we're estimating uh, the book's going to be about sixty pages, um, and that is you know with everything included and unlocked. Um, mm -hmm. If the campaign does well, so right now at time of recording we're at about sixty two percent funding with twenty eight days left to go. I'm not really worried about hitting the goal. I think. Uh, you know, I've got some irons in the fire and things that I can do to get us there. Uh, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to get everything we need into the book. But if we do really well, you know, who else knows what's going to be, be added? Um, but I'm trying to keep it within the 60 page count because uh, that'll allow me to print it more effective, cost effectively here in Portland, Oregon, be able to hand number and uh, ship them out at a rate that is. Uh, again, cost-effective to the backer, um, and create in a, the similar way that I did with the pogs for three minutes. I really want to make a limited uh, version of this thing, uh, or at least the printed version of this thing to make it feel unique and special. Um, I'm a small-time, part-time game designer making very niche content for a very niche audience. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity to create something that feels like it can be really cherished over time and feel like you really contributed and made something happen rather than have it be this mass market book that's all over the place, which, you know, I don't hate that. Like, pension still sells today. Um, it is still going into the hands of people. People are still discovering it. And I, I love that about it. And I'm excited for the expansion to do that as well. But because I'm dealing with smaller audiences, I really want to be mindful of that and make sure that you feel you feel that sense of this can't happen without me, um, and I'm going to be rewarded for that. Uh, and so that's that's why we're sticking within that page count. That's why we're sticking with the two covers and the way that this is being distributed. Because once this gets printed and it's out the door it won't be printed in this format ever again. That's not to say that Henshin won't get, you know, my dream far down the line is that maybe we do a huge book of all of the Tokusatsu games together, right? And it's everything because uh, Henshin's its own game, now with an expansion, Rider Kanchu is kind of a hack of the Henshin system, and Three Minutes, while it's distinctly very different, still shares some, like, design aesthetics and qualities. And I think having a tokusatsu trilogy would be great but that's you know uh, uh that's a horse of a different color um mm -hmm. right now i'm i'm focused on making this happen making it feel special and making the people who contribute feel appreciated because i can't i can't do it without you it wouldn't be the success that it's been without uh the people listening and the people backing and the people who play the game mm-hmm yeah, I can I can certainly get that. So with the, with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? So everything um if everything goes according to plan, I am hoping to release this in October of this year and that is uh have it out the door and ideally in people's hands by October. So that means shipping in September. There's still a bit to do uh, on this project. You know, everything, all the core rules are written, um, but we need to get art made for the modules and finish the uh, writing of the modules to be incorporated into the book. The book also has to be laid out and then uh, printed. Um, and then I have to sign and hand number everything and pack everything uh, from my house um, and then ship it all out. So October feels achievable with the amount of work that we need to do. Um, and luckily all of my designers and printers and writers are lined up 
and understand the timeline and what we're working with. So I, I feel pretty strongly that we can make that work. Um, and I also know that, you know, if we, if for whatever reason, if there's anything that's outside of our control uh, happens and we need to go uh, a month or so out, people are understanding and gracious. It's more about um, any delays that would come with this project if they come up are to ensure the quality of the book is intact rather than me dilly-dallying and not doing the work. Like, if there's anybody who's listening who's not familiar with me, <laughs> I'm, I'm a project manager by trade and by nature. I'm constantly thinking about what I need to do to get these things done, and I'm able to deliver uh, any and all of my projects uh, you know, within the time and scope that I, uh, I allot to. And if I don't, or if I have a reason that I need to shift, I'm clear and reasonable about presenting all of that. So know that this is not a Kickstarter where you're going to be lost in the sauce or not communicated with. Uh, you will be up to date with what is going on as I know it. Um, and if there's anything that I need from y'all, know that I will be clear about asking what that is um, and be respectful of your time because uh, I know you're respectful of mine and I appreciate that. And it's all, you know, it's a two-way street, baby. So, mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Of course. Thank you for having me, Bilger. It's always a wonderful to talk to you, and I appreciate the thoughtful questions. It's great to be able to, you know, I think only, people can only get so much out of the the Kickstarter page and reading what we've written. Uh, it's great to be able to talk about these things and talk about how they can be incorporated into the larger uh, the larger game. So I appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks so much. I'll see you next time. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!